Well, I'm looking forward to another lesson from Judges by Devin. He's doing a great job. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight will be from Judges 8, verses 1 through 28. I read this through a couple of times today out loud and did a good job. <laughs> but when I get finished, Devin's not going to have much time to preach. <laughs> I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. So he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizar? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Median, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward them subsided when he said that. When Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 3,000 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. Then he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted. And I am pursuing Zeba and Zalmana, kings of Median. And the leaders of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmana now in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmana, to you into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then he went up from there to Peniel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Peniel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. So he also spoke to the men of Peniel saying, when I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. Now Zeba and Zelmana were at Karkar, and their armies with them, about 15,000, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbeha, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. When Zeba and Zamana fled, he pursued them, and he took the two kings of Media, Median, Zeba and Zelmana, and routed the whole army. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle, from the ascent of Heres. And he called a young man of the men of Succoth and interrogated him, and he wrote down for him the leaders of Succoth, and his elders, and its elders, 77 men. Then he came to the men of Succoth and said, Here are Zeba and Zelmana, about whom you ridicule me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zelmana now in your hand that we should give bread to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. Then he tore down the tower at Peniel and killed the men of the city. And he said to Zeba and Zebna, What kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? So they answered, As you are, as were they, each one resembled the son of a king. Then he said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Jether, his firstborn, Rise, kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. So Zeba and Zalmanah said, Rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmanah, and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson. Also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. 
Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you, that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered, We will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment, and each man threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the, cre the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around their camels' necks. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city, Hopra, and all Israel played the harlot with it there, it became a snare to Gideon into his house. So Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads, heads no more. And the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. I said it before, I'll say it again. Sometimes you got to tell the story in order to tell the story. So I appreciate Don for doing that. Gideon's come a long way from the wine press, hadn't he? When we first started looking at Gideon's life in the book of Judges, where did we find him? We found him hiding in the wine press. What was he doing there? He was threshing out wheat. Not the place to do that. I mean, uh, you, do, you thresh wheat in an in a open space so that the wind can carry the chaff away and you only have the wheat there to collect. It's kind of hard to do in an enclosed space. But that's why Gideon was doing it. He was doing it because he was afraid that his crop would get stolen from the Midianites, who he was scared to death of. Remember how the Bible describes them. They were like locusts, and their camels were like sand upon the seashore. I mean, they were an imposing enemy, but yet the angel of the Lord, if you remember, appeared to Gideon and said, hello, hero. And Gideon's like, you talking to me? And Gideon was a hesitant hero. And then as he learns more and he begins to step out in faith more, we begin to see that he goes from being a hesitant hero to a questioning servant. And so we see the, the episode with the fleece, the dry, the wet, the dry, the wet, questioning God. And it's amazing how patient God was with him. Stop and think about it. It's pretty amazing how patient he is with us. And so he moves from hesitant hero to questioning servant to you got to be kidding me, general. Because he finally gets up enough gumption, he finally has enough trust in God that he's ready, at least as ready as he can be, to lead. And he shows up, he's got 32,000 against 135,000. Did you notice that 120,000 fell by the sword in the reading just a minute ago? God did that. But yet, Gideon shows up, he's got 32,000, 135,000, the odds are against him. But guess what? God said, you know what, buddy? You got too many. And so, he says, if you're afraid, you remember last week, if you're afraid, you can go home. 22,000 said, see you later. That had to be devastating for, for Gideon to watch 22,000 of his countrymen just walk away. But they did. And he had 10,000 against 135,000. And you know what God said? You still got too many. And so takes them down to the river and says, okay, I want you to watch these guys take a drink. And of the 10,000, 9,700 of them didn't drink the way God wanted them to. So he said, move them aside, and here's what you got left, 300. Now I think you can handle it, Gideon. And Gideon's like, you got to be kidding me. What we see tonight, and what Don read just a moment ago, is we've come full circle. We have seen the character development and change in Gideon. Gideon is a different man now. He's a totally different man. And he's moved from being that hesitant hero now 
to being an arrogant ruler. And so before we get into the lesson, let's go to God in prayer together. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us back. It's been a beautiful day today. We had a wonderful time of Bible study this morning, and the worship, I hope, today was pleasing to you. It was a wonderful time for us to come together as church family, and we had a number of visitors this morning, and just so good to, to have them with us. Some folks that, that I've met in the community joined us this morning, that uh, I've met at some of the prayer rallies here in town, and, and what a blessing it is to see people that you meet in the community take that step to come in and be in a part of your, the worship service here. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to be with them and that doors will be open to this city for people to know that when they come into this place amongst your people, that they will be loved and they will be welcomed and encouraged to return. Spirit, I pray that this message tonight is yours that you will take this very familiar character of the Bible and we see a lot of ourselves in him. We see where we've been very hesitant to follow you, where we've asked for you to prove things to us. And then sometimes when you answer our prayers, more often than we like to admit, we want to take credit for it, just like Gideon did. Spirit, help us tonight to see how pride and arrogance can be very destructive. Help us to see that in ourselves and help us in a very loving way to be able to point that out to others so that they draw closer to you. Lord, we we love you. We praise you. We thank you so much for all that you do for us. In Jesus we pray. Amen. What do Michael Jackson, Judy Garland... Nikola Tesla, Joe Lewis, and Edgar Allan Poe all have in common. That's quite a list, isn't it? What do they all have in common? Every single one of them died broke. Every one of them. You know, we've all heard the stories about famous people who just couldn't handle the success. They couldn't handle the success, they couldn't handle the power, they couldn't handle the wealth that came with that. Mike Tyson, everybody know who's Mike? Well, not everybody, most of us, all the guys better know who Mike Tyson is. Mike Tyson has made over $400 million, and he lost all of it. How do you do that? I don't know. I've heard a lot of people say, man, I'd like to find out how you do that. But he he managed to to accomplish that. You know, some people just can't handle it. But it's not not restricted to just, you know, movie stars and inventors and and sports figures. Uh, We find this uh, with people that are considered to be leaders of the church as well. Because they can't handle the power. We know of, of people, we've heard of people who have similar problems, who've reached a level of success to the point that they think that they're infallible. Let me give you some names. Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart, and my personal favorite, a local Dallas guy, Robert Tilton. Those are the names that come to my mind. They were people who were considered by others to be spiritual leaders, but they could not handle the success. They couldn't handle the power. They couldn't handle the influence that came with that And given what we've read so far and what we've studied so far in the book of Judges regarding Gideon, you would think, I mean, you would think by now, he would be the last person who would struggle with this. You would think that he would be the last person that something even remotely similar to that would happen to. You know, God had clearly proven something. God had clearly proven that he alone was responsible for the victory over the Midianites. But, but how Gideon responds to that, when it's all said and done, and what Don read just a moment ago, is very disappointing. And what we're going to see is yet another situation 
where the old saying is true. Pride goes before the fall. And we see that in application in the life of Gideon. In verses 1 to 3 of our text that was read just a moment ago, we see the wisdom that Gideon has acquired in his relationship with God. We see the growth that Gideon has experienced. Look at what it says. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, Why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously, but he said to them, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abiezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Now, family, take a good look at that right there. Look at that situation. And notice how diplomatically Gideon handles it. Ephraim was a tribe to the south. They were the ones that were the furthest <clears throat> away from the battle. And, and Gideon did not call upon them because they would have had to travel all the way to the battlefront and then turn and fight. And, Ephraim, uh, and, and Gideon strategically in his mind is thinking, okay, if we send them on the run, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna send them toward Ephraim. And that's exactly what happened. But Ephraim was upset because they weren't called to the original battle. And that's what's going on here. They were upset because they had not been called to assist in pursuit of the, of the Midianites. But here's the thing. Gideon called them up to pursue them after they were on the run. And the Ephraimites captured and executed the two Midianite kings, Orb and Zeb. But that wasn't enough for them. Apparently, they felt slighted. They felt like they had been left out and not been included in the battle, and that upset them. And this highlights, family, a universal point of leadership. There will always be people who will never be satisfied. As a leader, there will always be people who are never satisfied and will take every opportunity to criticize the decisions that you make. Ask any leader. Gideon sees this. He recognizes it for what it is. And in the response that comes from the leaders of Ephraim, and so when he sees this, he recognizes it. He's prepared for it. He's ready to address it. In fact, he may have even anticipated it coming. And in the process, we learn a few things. Gideon could have argued against their assessment. He could have said, oh, no, 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 wait, 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 hold up, time out, time out. That's not the way it, that's not the way it, it happened. That's not the way I intended for it to happen. He could have argued against their conclusion. But here's the thing. That argument would have only escalated the situation. Instead, Gideon swallowed his pride, somewhat, and showed wisdom in the approach that he took to resolve the issue. Look at verses 2 and 3. But he answered them, What have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abiezer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Take a good look at that. Because that, family, is a great example of how to diffuse a volatile situation. These Ephraimites, they were mad. I mean, they were angry with Gideon. But in response, rather than argue his position, Gideon minimizes his role and elevates their role. Gideon chose not to promote his own position. But instead, he chose to build them up. Family, I mean, that's what a great leader does. That is an example right there. What you see on the screen, that is a great example of what a good leader does, amongst other things, in a conflict situation with those he is leading. 
He tells them that they have more recognition at the end of the day. Because they were the ones that captured and they were the ones that executed the Midianite kings. He chose to show honor to those who had set out to dishonor him. And in the process, he de-escalated the situation and won the peace. That right there, what you see there, is what a good leader does. Right there, in that moment, Gideon is exactly where he needs to be. He is the man of God that he's been called to be. He's got his priorities straight. He's got his head screwed on straight. He's there to lead the people on behalf of the Lord. Unfortunately, that attitude of Gideon didn't last. And we see how this unfolds in verses 4 through 21. As Gideon continues in the pursuit, he is now pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna. And his men are tired, they're hungry, and they're thirsty. And so they come upon these two towns, Succoth and Peniel. And he's there, when he stops there, he says, look, my guys need some food, my guys need some water, my guys need supplies. And he goes to the leaders, he says, you need to give these things to my men so that we can continue to pursue these enemies of ours. And the leaders of these, the elders, the leaders of these uh, towns say, well, hold up, wait a second. Wait a second, we're not so sure that we need to do that. Because if you don't capture them and you don't kill them, then we have to deal with their wrath. We're going to have to deal with the consequences of that decision. If Zeba and if Zalmunna survive, what's going to happen to us then? Well, this didn't sit well with Gideon. In fact, it didn't, it didn't sit well with him at all. But here's the thing. If anybody should have understood the patience, if anybody should have understood fear and caution, you would think that it would be Gideon. Remember, this is the guy that we met in the wine press threshing out wheat. Because he acted the same way. He acted the same way, and God was gracious, and God was merciful to him. But Gideon's changed. Gideon's different. And their refusal made Gideon very angry. And he promised to punish them when he came back victorious. And this is exactly what he did when we pick up in verses 15 to 17. It says, Then Gideon came and said to the men of Succoth, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me. I find that interesting. Whom you taunted me by saying, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Succoth a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars. He also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of that town. Gideon has changed. In fact, Gideon's gone off the grid. And there's no indication that I know of or I can find or this is something that the Lord counseled him to do. He's completely overreacted. God showed mercy to him. God showed patience toward him. But he wasn't willing to follow the Lord's example in his response to others. Do you know what that is? That's hypocrisy. This is hypocrisy and a lack of self-control. This is where Gideon is. And his anger continues. His anger continues to burn as he channels it toward uh, Zeba and Zalmunna in verses 18 and 19. Then he asks Zeba and Zalmunna, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered. Each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives... I would not kill you. Now take a good look at what he says there. What's motivating Gideon? 
What is it that's driving him? What is it that, that's making him go right now? Is it allegiance to the Lord? Is it a love for his people? Is it a desire to set them free? No. Gideon's motivation is revenge. That's his motivation. There's a famous line from the movie, The Godfather. It's not personal. It's business. Let me tell you something right now, with Gideon, it's personal. It's very, very personal. Because he's no longer in the business of the Lord, but he is driven by his personal motivation toward vengeance. He was being driven by his own agenda family, and he was wrong. Now, did he have a reason to be angry? Yes. They were responsible for the deaths of his brothers. But with that being said, did he have the right to act as judge and executioner by his own authority? No, he did not. And by doing so, he usurped God's authority, and this was wrong. This is where Gideon is at. Not only was Gideon wrong, but he was becoming warped in his judgment by his own power. He not only killed these men, but he attempted to involve his own son, his own child, in the process. Now, when you look at verse 20, it says, Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, Kill them! But Jether did not draw his sword, because he was only a boy and was afraid. Now look at what that says on the screen. Picture that in your mind. What does that look like? What does it feel like to be Jether? A boy with a sword who probably has no business being there to begin with, and your father telling you, putting you on the spot, hey, kill these two guys. Can you imagine what it was like to be him? And your father trying to make a man out of you by asking you to do something that you just couldn't do. Pride and arrogance fueled by vengeance, has pushed Gideon to this point. That he's even warped in his judgment with regard to his own son. Zeba and Zalmunna see this. They see it. And they see this as an opportunity to go out with one last insult thrown Gideon's way. And we see this in the response in verse 21. Zeba and Zalmunna said, Come on, come do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed him. And took the ornaments off their camel's necks. Culturally, culturally speaking, it would have been a great insult for for Gideon's son, a boy, to kill them. Zeb and Zalmunna knew that. They weren't going to stand for it. They knew they were going out anyway. Hey, if we're going to go out, we might as well go out the best way that we can. And so they put Gideon on the spot. As the man is, so is his strength. And what they're saying is, hey, don't staff it out to your son. Don't staff it out to this boy. You're a man. Act like a man. You do it. And they were right. So Gideon, he stepped up through his anger and his pride and his arrogance. And he did it. You know, it would be bad enough if we could say that Gideon's arrogance ended there. But it didn't. You would think that putting his son in that position and then seeing the reaction of his son and, and the reaction of 
Zalmunna and, and Zeba and how they reacted and what they said, you would think that would get his attention and that that would be it. You would think we could, could say, well, that, that, was, that was the end of, of, of Gideon's issue with pride and, and arrogance and vengeance, but it wasn't. In verses 22 to 35, we see just how far it would go. After the victory was secured and the enemy kings were gone, the Israelites say to Gideon in verses 22 to 24, Rule over us. You, your son and your grandsons, because you have saved us from Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder, as it was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. Look at what Gideon says there in the first part of that. He said the right thing. Gideon said the right thing. He said exactly what he needed to say. Look at how Gideon responds to the request of the people. And they say, you rule over us, your sons and your grandsons. It appears that Gideon has a small window of clarity. And that window quickly closes. He says, I'll not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. That was the perfect response to that request. He said the right thing. That is exactly what he needed to say, to redirect the people to the Lord as their true leader and their true king. And then that window closes. And then he continues in verse 24. He says, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. Now, why would he make that request? Why would he ask that? I mean, did he not have an equal share like everybody else? Why would he ask for that? Did he feel like uh, he needed and deserved a little more of the plunder because he was the leader? Or did he have something else in mind? Was his mind already working and the wheels turning towards something else? The people viewed Gideon as their hero. Even though the Lord earned the victory over the Midianites. And Gideon knew it. Gideon knew that. But the people still didn't give the Lord the honor that was due him. And even though Gideon refused the role of king and title, he basically accepted the entitlements that come along with it. The first kingly entitlement that he claims is to ask for more of the spoils of war from his troops. He asked for one earring each from all of his troops which were probably taken off of dead Midianites. And the weight of all that gold came out to about 43 pounds. He had plans for that gold. And we find out about it later. But here's the thing. Family, pride, and arrogance are difficult vices to overcome. And we see that Gideon had not overcome those vices in his life. We also learn of another kingly entitlement that Gideon claims for himself. We see it in verses 29 to 32. And I want you to notice how Gideon is referred to. They don't call him Gideon. Now he's Jerob Baal. Jerob Baal, son of Joash, went back home to live. He had 70 sons of his own. For he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the Abizarites. 
Now, family, during this time and several centuries to follow, royalty would try to leave a legacy of lineage. They would take many wives. That's what Gideon did. Gideon was trying to leave a legacy, a legacy of flesh rather than a legacy of faith. And we see in the passage that's, that's on the screen that he had a son with a woman from Shechem, which was expressly forbidden because these people were foreigners who worshipped idols. God didn't want His people to become united with idol worshipers. This was strictly forbidden, and Gideon knew that. The name of his son, the Bible tells us, is Abimelech, which means child of the king, or my father is the king. Now think about that for just a second. In either sense, whether, whether it means child of the king or my father is the king, by naming his son and allowing his son to be named Abimelech is very overt in a display of Gideon's pride and arrogance. And that pride and that arrogance lived on in his son. When you look at the story of Abimelech, oh yeah, you talk about a prideful and arrogant man. He later wanted to ascend to the throne of Shechem. But there was just one small problem. The 70 sons of Gideon, his half-brothers. Well, that wasn't no problem for him. He just murdered all of them. Pride and arrogance breeds pride and arrogance. And by naming his son or allowing his son to be named Abimelech, it was a very overt insult to the Lord himself. And I don't know whether you know this or not, every Philistine king, every idol-worshiping Philistine king bore the name Abimelech. From Abraham up to this point and beyond, every Philistine king bore the name Abimelech. But you know what? Probably the most damaging entitlement of pride and arrogance that Gideon claimed for himself is seen in verse 27. It says, Gideon made the gold, that 43 pounds of gold, into an ephod, which he placed in Orpha, his town, his hometown. And all Israel prostituted themselves to it by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Well, there's the plan for all that gold. What did Gideon do with that 43 pounds of gold? He made it into a tourist attraction. He made it into a trophy. He made it into a monument to himself. Family pride and arrogance are difficult vices to overcome. Gideon was supposed to turn his people away from idol worship. Gideon was supposed to lead the people of God away from these things. Instead, he created a new idol by his own will and by his own hand for the people to prostitute themselves and worship. Family like Gideon, God gives us victories in our life. You know, many times we're, we're reluctant like Gideon was. When we have a, an obstacle before us that we need, no, need to accomplish, and we know that God wants us to step out in faith and try to accomplish that, we can all identify with a hesitant hero, can't we? But then we begin to trust the Lord, and the Lord equips us with what we need to accomplish that goal. And we test God. We put those things out there to test Him. We fleece God, don't we? But God is patient with us. And He helps us through it. And then we see what's before us, just like Gideon did. And we look at the resources we have, and we look at what we need to do, and we think, man, Lord, there's just too big a gap. I can't do it. 
And God says, yeah, you're right. That's the point. We can do it together. Trust me. And then we trust the Lord. And we're able to accomplish those things. Whatever it is. We're able to, to get that promotion. We're able to, to hit that certain point in, in, in our 401k. We're able to, to achieve whatever it is that we think is unachievable, but we pray about it and God gives us what we need to accomplish it. And He gives it to us. He gifts it to us. Just like with Gideon. And then we get real full of ourselves. Just like Gideon did. We can relate to Gideon. Maybe not to the same extreme, but we get it. We get it. God gives us victories in our lives by answering prayers and helping us accomplish things in what otherwise would seem impossible situations and impossible odds. The detention is to say, look what I did for myself. Look what I did. And then we start hanging up our trophies. But where do we hang up our trophies? It's about to reach for my phone. It's on the pew. Where do we, where do, where do we, where do we post our trophies? Social media. We do the same thing. It's very tempting. We say, look what I did for myself. Rather than praise God, look what He's done for me. And just like Gideon, we too sometimes discover that all too often, pride goes before the fall. And so let me ask you a question this evening as we close. Are you struggling with an arrogance problem? Are you struggling with some sort of pride issue? And that can take a lot of different forms. It can, it can appear in many different ways. Have you had somebody say to you, you know what, you're too proud? Have you had somebody say, you know, you, you're just a little bit too, too big for your britches? you got an arrogance problem. And what's our natural inclination when somebody tells us something like that? We blow them off. That's arrogance. <laughs> That's pride. Especially when it's somebody that we know loves us. Fellas, if your wife is telling you, you know what, you got a pride problem, you better listen to her. Because she knows what she's talking about. If one of your brothers in Christ says, hey man, you, got, you, need to, you need to tone it down a little bit. You need to think about what you're saying and what you're doing. You need to listen to them. I don't know what pride and arrogance burden you're carrying, but it's going to destroy you if you don't address it. It destroyed Gideon. The Bible says that it was a snare to him and his family. You know what that means? It was generational. The decisions he made, the decisions we make, aren't just within ourselves. It has a ripple effect. Maybe your children right now are dealing with a problem for a decision that you made a long time ago. And you've never brought that to the Lord. You've just hoped for the best. Well, maybe what you need to do is flip that around and bring it to the Lord and plan for the best to happen because you turned it over to God. Whatever you're struggling with tonight, if you have one of those issues or something else, I'll tell you what a pride and arrogance problem is. It's when you're dealing with something and you will not share that with anybody. I can handle it all myself. I got this. Well, how's that working out for you? I'm too proud to walk that aisle. I'm too proud to tell somebody that I got a problem with alcohol. I got a problem with pornography. I got a problem with that person in my office. I got a problem with that neighbor. The relationship with my son or my daughter isn't what it should be. 
If you won't share that and let people pray with you and pray for you, that's a pride problem. The Bible says bear one another's burdens. That wasn't a request. It was a command. So we need to do that and trust the Lord with it. Maybe the biggest arrogant pro- arrogance problem and pride problem is when we don't think that we need the Lord. And we're not ready to surrender to God. I got news for you. Nobody's getting out of here alive. Nobody's getting out of the world alive. Don't worry. I'm going to let you out here in a minute. You're going to get out of here. I'm not going to preach till we're all gone. But to think that we can save ourselves is the ultimate arrogance. Because it flies in the face of what Jesus did at the cross. Jesus died so you don't have to carry that burden. Let him take it off of you. Let us pray with you and pray for you. Whatever you need tonight, let's let's take care of it now while we stand and sing.